Well, good morning. morning. You know, uh, I like the red chili. And you know, I could probably, you know, red chili for breakfast uh, could probably grow on me. I I think that's interesting. I like that. Uh, But you really haven't had breakfast until you've sat down to a big old bowl of buttered grits. That's a breakfast now. Hey, I think we would be remiss if we didn't uh, show our appreciation uh, to Pastor Ray and to all of the wonderful servants here at Calvary Chapel. Thank you so much for hosting us this week. These guys have done a wonderful job. Let's turn in our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 4. The title of my message this morning Healing a fever in your family. Healing a fever in your family. We've talked about our responsibility to our personal relationship with Jesus, our responsibilities to our church, to our community, to our calling. Now this morning we want to look at our responsibilities to our family. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for our families. And Lord, only you know the hurts, the scars, the wounds that exist in the relationships of our families. Lord, we can't go through this world and maintain a family and keep a family intact without some hits and without some some attacks. We're living living in a hostile world, hostile to you and hostile to Toward families. Lord, we want to seek your face today, Lord. We need your help. And Lord, I ask that you bring healing to our families this morning. Lord, you did it in Peter's family. And Lord, I believe you want to do it in our families today. So Lord, work in our hearts by your spirit, through your word, in Jesus' name, amen. A pastor and his wife were once leading a tour of Israel. It was a large group and he had been able to bring along his mother-in-law. And yet she was far from grateful. I mean, for the whole trip, the old gal complained about all of the pastor's decisions. Well, one night at dinner, the woman started gagging. No one noticed she was choking on the matzo balls. And tragically, the mother-in-law died. Well, in a few days later, the mortician sat down with the pastor and he laid out his options. He said, now, we can ship her body back to America, but it'll cost you $10,000. Or we can bury your mother-in-law here in Israel and it'll only be 150 bucks. Well, the pastor never hesitated. He said, oh, we'll ship her body back to America. Well, the coroner, being Jewish, appreciating the notion of saving a shekel, He repeated himself. He says, now let me make sure you understand what I'm saying. It's going to cost you $10,000 to transfer her body to America, whereas we can bury her in Israel here for $150. Finally, the pastor explained. He says, well, I understand your point, but my Lord Jesus was buried here in Israel, and he rose from the dead three days later, and I just can't take that chance with my mother-in-law. Once a friend and I, we were discussing our mother-in-laws. He told me how much help his mother-in-law was, how supportive she was, how they got along so well together. And that's when I commented, I said, well, my mother-in-law lives in Oregon on the other side of the continent. He replied, he said, wow, if my mother-in-law lived in Oregon, I'd have her move. I said, I've tried, but she won't go to Japan. (laughs) Hey, pastors and mother-in-laws have been and can be a volatile combination, as we'll see in our passage this morning. For here in Luke chapter 4, Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law, and in so doing proves forever that when God sent his son into the world, when God became a man, he came to be the friend of all marriages and all families. 
Well, let's read our text beginning in Luke chapter 4, verse 38. Now he, that is meaning Jesus, arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. I want you to notice four movements in this story. They reveal how God wants to move in the story of our family. First, Jesus comes over. He is invited to Simon's house. Second, the family has a problem that they turn over to Jesus. Third, Jesus takes over the situation. You'll notice he stands over this sick woman. And then fourth, Jesus drives out the fever and Simon's family starts over and is reestablished on a path of service. Here's our outline this morning. Jesus comes over, the family turns over their problem to him. He takes over the situation and his healing allows this family to start over. First, Jesus comes over to Simon Peter's house and notice where they were previously. Jesus arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now, don't miss this. It may be the most important point that I make the whole sermon. Simon Peter brings Jesus home from church. Do you notice that? Simon Peter brings Jesus home from church. See, for the Jews, the synagogue was their place of worship. The Christian equivalent would be a church gathering. There was worship and there was scripture exposition in the synagogue. And Jesus had been there that morning. Jesus was in the house that day, which I'm sure made the service special. But the healing Simon Peter's family needed didn't take place in the synagogue. It happened later. For Simon's family, their first step toward health was to invite Jesus to return with them from the synagogue to their house. And if you want a healthy family, the first step for you is to invite Jesus home from church. And let me assure you that Jesus loves to get out of the synagogue and head home with his people, with people who invite him and want him there. While on earth, Jesus spent very little time, quite frankly, in the temple or in the synagogue. He spent most of his time interacting with common folk in the midst of daily life. He especially enjoyed spending time in their homes. Remember, Jesus attended a party at Matthew's house. He ate a meal in the home of Mary and Martha. He forgave a prostitute who sought him out while he visited in the home of a rabbi named Simon. He healed a bedridden paralytic who was lured through the roof of a house. We're told of Jairus, the Jewish official, whose little girl had died. The scripture tells us Jairus begged Jesus to come to his house. That's a good thing to do, beg Jesus to come to your house. His house had been invaded by death, and Jesus was his only hope. A humble Jairus begged Jesus to come home with him. And then remember what Jesus said after he had visited the home of Zacchaeus. He said, today salvation has come to this house. My point is, Jesus loves to make house calls. Don't misunderstand what goes on in the synagogue is important. And it is vital that we attend. There is a lot to be gained from worship in the synagogue. But if you're a pastor or a leader, you need to remember that the church is not your house. It's God's house. The church is not your bride, pastor. It's the bride of Christ. Jesus is happy you bring your family to his house, but far more will get done with you and yours when Jesus comes home with you to your house. There's a popular statistic that's been floated around for some time that one out of every three marriages end in divorce. Apparently that's across the board, or so the statistics say. Christians and non-Christians alike. That's what's been quoted for years. But it's not entirely true. It's true of nominal, non-committed Christians, 
But when the couple makes the effort to marry in a Christian church, the odds of divorce decrease to one out of 50. And of couples who keep coming back to church and do so regularly, it's one out of 100. And if the couple doesn't just go to church, but prays and reads their Bible together regularly, the odds of divorce decrease to one out of 1,000. In other words, healthy couples don't just say they're Christians or even go to church. They bring Jesus home from church. And yet for some pastors, they spend more time serving Jesus in God's house than they do involving Jesus in what goes on at their house. Recently, I found a top 10 list for pastors. Here's how a pastor can know if he's been spending too much time in his study at church. Number 10, when thou speakest to thy offspring and helpmate thusly. <laughs> Number nine, when you break down the sports page in chapters and verses. <laughs> Number eight, when you answer your home phone, Calvary Chapel. <laughs> Number seven, when you get upset because a family member didn't turn off their cell phone before dinner started. Number six, when you comfort your three-year-old who just skinned her knees by saying, oh, don't worry, honey, that'll make a great sermon illustration. <laughs> Not good. Number five, when you count going home for lunch as a pastoral visit. <laughs> Number four, when you get home late from a service and rebuke your wife for going to sleep without you by saying, could you not watch with me for one hour? <laughs> Number three, when a toilet backs up and you ask one of the assistant pastors to stop by your house and plunge it. <laughs> not good. Number two, when you start your dinner prayer now with every head bowed and every eye closed. <laughs> and number one, when you hear a country song, a catchy country song on the radio and you start praying the singer becomes a Christian so they'll write more similar sounding worship music. <laughs> My point is, is that we can spend too much time in the religious hot house called church and lose touch with what's going on in our own house. This was Eli's problem. Eli was the high priest of the Hebrew tabernacle. He was the original big guy. At the tabernacle, he was revered and respected and honored and placed on a pedestal. He felt like he was somebody. Oh, Eli loved serving God in the tabernacle. For when he got home, his wife needed him to take out the garbage and wash some dishes and help the kids with their homework none of which are very distinguished tasks for a high priest. His kids wanted his time and attention, but Eli was too tired from all the important tabernacle work that he had done to toss a football with his son or to help one of his boys learn to ride a bicycle. And over time, Esau, Eli excelled at tabernacle tasks. He excelled at priestly duties, but he flopped at fatherhood. He spent less and less time at home. Though God's call was first and foremost to be a dad, Eli preferred to be a priest. He was esteemed by synagogue goers. What a man of God, they said. It's a lot harder to get kudos from your kiddos. And after a while, he had no idea what his sons were doing and what kind of men they had become. And finally, God had to get his attention and in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13, God rebuked him. I have told Eli that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. Hope you notice God says nothing about Eli's successes at the tabernacle, though they were many. The weekly attendance or the annual budget is never mentioned. Rather, God judges this man because he failed in his most vital task, which was his family. Men, you can be a successful politician and be a lousy husband and father. A wealthy businessman and a lousy husband and father. A skilled doctor or lawyer and a lousy husband and father. But you can't be a faithful pastor while neglecting your kids and ignoring your wife. Paul's words to Timothy 
should ring in every pastor's ears. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Don't just go to church to serve Jesus, but bring Jesus home from church to help you serve your family. Please, whatever you do, don't make the mistake of sacrificing your family on the altar of ministry. The church people you think you need to please may or may not be there tomorrow. Who knows the fickle and petty reasons they'll give you when they get bored and up and leave your church. But at the end of the day, you want your wife to still be your wife. And you want those kids to still be proud of calling you their dad. Jim Lascalzo is a photojournalist who worked 16 years for U.S. News and World Report. He covered vital stories in over 60 countries around the world. Jim loved his job. He won countless awards, and he said he couldn't stop moving. Jim admitted, I'm a travel addict. But his relentless pace finally took its toll on his family. He was in Iraq during his wife's second miscarriage, and it was the last straw for Jim. It provoked him to give up his coveted profession. He decided to put his family first. Jim writes this in his memoirs. How do you stop moving? It's about accepting a simple truth. In the world of photojournalism, I will always be a man of minor accomplishments. But in the field of fatherhood, to one little boy at least, I have a chance to become a legend. Pastor, think of the tasks you do on a weekly basis. I dare say that 80% of those jobs can be done 80% as well by someone else. But there is only one person who can husband your wife and only one man who can father your child. I don't care what drives you, Pastor, but whatever causes you to put your family on the back burner, it's not worth it. It's time to come home and bring Jesus with you. You are both needed there. In the end, it's more important that your kids call you a great dad than it is that a lot of other folks you don't even know call you a great pastor. But notice what happens here next when Jesus enters Simon's home. He comes home to Simon with Simon, but then the family turns over their problem to Jesus. Again, verse 38 tells us, but Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. You know, at church, Simon Peter's family looked like a pristine, perfect family. It seemed to be a model family. But Jesus found a different story when he entered their home. Simon's mother-in-law had contracted an infection, and as a result was fighting a fever. Here, Dr. Luke calls it a high fever. The Greek word is megas. It was a mega fever. My wife, Kathy, she used to be a home health care nurse, and she witnessed situations where the infected patient was so severe that the whole house reeked with a foul odor. I mean, this is what Jesus may have found when he walked into this house. This mother-in-law's infection had contaminated the entire household. There was no hiding or covering up this illness. You smelled it when you walked into the door. The moment you walked into the house, you knew there was a problem. Reminds me of Charlie. His neighbor raised prize-winning rabbits. And Charlie was always worried about his dog jumping over the fence and helping himself to a snack. Well, one day, Charlie found Rover with a dead rabbit in his mouth. What would his neighbor do? Well, Charlie plotted a cover-up. He cleaned the rabbit off. He fluffed the hare's hair with a blow dryer. And then late that night, Charlie climbed over the fence and he placed the dead rabbit back into the cage. He hoped his neighbor would figure that the rabbit had died of natural causes. But the next day, Charlie gets a knock on the door. It was his neighbor. Charlie, we got a real problem. Charlie's wondering how he got discovered. The rabbit owner continued, yeah, somebody dug up this dead rabbit I buried. <laughs> cleaned it up, even fluffed it up with a blow dryer and put it back in the cage. Charlie, we got a real sicko in the neighborhood. <laughs> and just because a family cleans up 
and fluffs up and comes to church doesn't mean it's a healthy family. Simon Peter's family came to church. But when Jesus came over to their house, he found a different situation. He found a problem they desperately needed to turn over to him. I'm sure we all want folks to think that we have the perfect family. In fact, church folks even add to that pressure. We think, how will they treat us if they find out the pastor's family has a problem? It's only natural to want people to think that you and your husband are June and Ward Cleaver and your family is an episode of Leave it to Beaver. But you're not a cleaver and your kid ain't a beaver. Instead, you got a fever. <laughs> and if we want healing, we need to admit the problem and recruit the master's help. Do you recall Ananias and Sapphira? Here was the all-American couple living in Jerusalem. Ananias had been the captain of the high school football team. Sapphira was the homecoming queen. They had been the darlings of the youth group. I'm sure got married straight out of college. Now they're driving a Mercedes to church, dressing in designer jeans. They got a house out in the burbs. They even host a home fellowship. Ananias is being considered as potential elder material, no less. Here is the poster children for conservative evangelical success. But in reality, Ananias and Sapphira, though they had a growing faith, it was not a very mature faith. For they liked playing at religion and appearing spiritual. But when the believers around them started getting serious about commitment and sacrifice and genuine faith, they felt uncomfortable. This was a threat to their lifestyle. They didn't want to look bad or get left out. To this star-studded couple, image was everything. They couldn't tolerate appearing unspiritual. So, uh, so they told the apostles that they were giving all when in reality they were holding back. Realize God never required the selling of their parcel. Never. Nor did he ask them to give the proceeds to the church. What was being done was being done strictly voluntary. And neither did God tell Ananias to give all of the proceeds. He could have just donated a portion, just tithed and said so. Been honest about it. Candor would have saved this man's life. Ananias' sin, which led to his death, was to give part, yet claim to give all. He put looking good over being real. He lied to the church and to God's spirit. Don't ever think you can lie with impunity. Hypocrisy will always get found out. It's been said, there is no such thing as an inconsequential lie. Ananias put impressing people above pleasing God, and it cost he and his wife their life. But here, where Jesus enters Simon's house, no one tries to cover up the problem. They do just the opposite as Ananias and Sapphira. We're told they made request of him concerning her. In other words, they exposed their problem to Jesus, and they turned it over to him. Guys, leadership in your family begins with confession and admission and exposure and disclosing your problem. This is the first step toward a family's healing. How can a doctor treat a wound unless you show him where it hurts? We need to invite Jesus over, then we need to turn over our infections to the great physician. For once they made their request, Jesus immediately brought down the fever and brought healing to the lady. Reminds me of the magician who was asked to name his favorite trick. He said he really enjoyed sawing young ladies in half. He claimed that he used to practice on his family. The interviewer asked, wow, you must have a rather large family. The magician answered, said, you're right, I got eight half sisters. <laughs> you know, sometimes we think that we can cure family fevers on our own. We rely on our own tricks and our own manipulations and techniques. And for a time, we can reduce a fever 
It's like popping a few Tylenol. They have calmed the fever. They'll mask the symptoms. But something stronger is needed to drive out the infection and to facilitate the healing. And likewise with a family fever. Lots of temporary situations can draw a splintered family together for a time. A needed vacation, a fun day away, a wedding perhaps, maybe a holiday. But it takes more to permanently unite a broken family. Hey, it takes a work of God to bring healing to a family fever. Notice verse 39. Luke tells us the measures that Jesus took. He rebuked the fever and it left her. Hey, this is how Jesus cast out demons. He rebuked them. Evidently, Jesus saw this fever that had threatened Simon's house as a direct result of spiritual warfare. The devil was at the root of this infection attacking his family. And I believe this is often true today. The sickness in many families, especially ministry families, is ultimately the result of a spiritual attack. See, if the devil can bring down the shepherd, he can hijack the sheep. Earlier, I referred to the struggle I had with my own mother-in-law. It was real. For a time, we didn't really get along. She was definitely skeptical of me. One day, I mentioned my problem to a friend. And I'll never forget, he said to me, have you prayed about it? And I responded, what did you say? I'm a pastor. But it never dawned on me to pray about my mother-in-law. Well, I finally did. I made it a point of prayer. And immediately, my relationship with mom improved. In fact, today, I get along better with mom than my wife does. <laughs> it turns out the issue was spiritual. And all it took to be healed was to get Jesus involved. Perhaps your family's fever is also of spiritual origin. It reminds me of the pastor and his wife who were on a strict financial budget. This is why the pastor got so angry when he found a bill, a receipt for $300 in the floor of the car for the wife's new dress. He asked her, he said, honey, how could you do this? You know how, money, how tight money is these days. She says, yes, but the devil himself was shopping with me. And he convinced me that this dress looked so good I had to buy it. The pastor tried to disciple his wife. Sweetheart, in those moments, you've just got to yell out loud, get behind me, Satan. She said, I did that. And then the devil said, the dress even looks good from back here. <laughs> hey, Satan has been at his business, business for a long time, has he not? We, we are no match for his wiles. That's why we need to be strong in the Lord. And we need to trust Jesus to fight our battles for us. This is why we need to turn over our problems to him. He who is, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Well, Jesus came over to Peter's house and they turned over their problem to him. And the third movement in the story, Jesus took over the situation. He dealt with the fever in Simon's house only after they allowed Jesus to take over the environment. Again, notice the family member who was sick was the mother-in-law. And mother-in-laws are notorious for taking over families. Now, if you're a mother-in-law, I'm sure you're the exception. <laughs> but deserving or not, mother-in-laws have the reputation for being a little controlling and domineering. They like to run the show. It's been said, a mother-in-law is a woman who is never outspoken. Based on your own experience, you can take that term outspoken as one word or two. And it's my hunch that Simon's mother-in-law ran the show in this house. That's why I think it's no accident that Luke gives us Jesus' position here. Notice, he stood over her. Granted, I'm just assuming Simon's mother-in-law ran the show in his house. It may have been Simon. It may have been his wife. But it needed to be Jesus. If you know your Bible, you understand 
that God has established a definite order in our home. The husband should lead. The wife should love and support him. The children should respect their parents. But before, but before any of this can be a functioning reality, everyone in the family needs to get in line behind Jesus. The whole household must allow Jesus to take over. One little girl probably summed up the balance of power in most families. She and her father were sitting on the couch when she asked him, she said, Daddy, you're the boss of the house, right? All right? Well, the proud poppy puffed out his chest. He answered, yes, sweetheart, I'm the boss of the house. But then his daughter burst his bubble. She added, you're the boss of the house because mommy put you in charge, huh, Daddy? <laughs> hey, let me tell you who I think needs to be in charge of your family. Not your mother-in-law, not your wife, not your children, not even the dad. The fever in your family won't be cured until everyone lets Jesus take over. As a family, it needs to be decided that Jesus is in charge. He should have full authority over our lives and relationships. Once a mother told her little boy to fetch the newspaper he had had earlier in the day. She wanted to go through the ads, but she couldn't find the newspaper. Little boy shrugged his shoulders. He told his mom he had no idea where he'd put the paper. She growled, she said, now, you had it last, and you better find it. And if you can't remember where it is, then you better ask God to help you find it. A few minutes later, the mother walked into her son's room and overheard him praying, God, you go this way and I'll go that way. <laughs> and see, here's our problem. We also like to give God directions, don't we? Especially when it comes to our family. Oh, I am an expert at what my wife does wrong and how my kids can do better and how my grandkids need to be raised. I'm the expert. But I have so many blind spots when it comes to my own attitudes. When I think I'm the boss, I tend to speak out. But when I acknowledge that Jesus is in control, I place myself in a position to be spoken to. Jesus will drive the fever out of your family and bring healing once he is acknowledged as the head. If you want his help, don't just turn the fever over to Jesus. Go a step further and turn over your family. In this story, Jesus comes over. Then they turn over the problems. Then he takes control. And then Jesus brings healing and this family starts over afresh and new. For as soon as his mother-in-law is healed, notice... She begins to serve. We read the account as a miracle of healing. But verse 39 to me records the real miracle. It occurs after the healing. Immediately she arose and served them. This woman was healed to help. The Lord brought this mother-in-law all the way from sickness to service. Let me suggest contributing to every family fever is an infection called selfishness. Self-absorption, egotism, self-centeredness is what infects a family and drives up a fever. Rather than acting like a family, individual concerns begin to dominate. And if left untreated, the deadliness of selfishness eventually kills off any concern and love that existed among family members. Perhaps you've been to counseling You've been told your family problems are so complex and complicated, and maybe they are, but maybe they're more simple than you think. For imagine, if everyone in your family stopped being selfish and just got concerned about each other, would life improve? I bet it would. It's interesting that Luke doesn't tell us the means by which Jesus healed this woman's fever. We consider it a miracle. It defies human explanation. But in Mark's parallel account, he makes an interesting observation. Mark writes this. So Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her and she served them. The master touched the woman's hand and lifted her. And that's when the fever left. And this is how Jesus often works today. 
He sparks faith in the person's heart before he brings healing to their bones or their body. Recall the man with the withered hand. Jesus told the crippled fellow, stretch out your hand. It was an impossible command, but he was fleshing out any faith left in this man's beaten down heart. And in the moment the man believed, the impossible occurred, the miracle occurred. Perhaps this is what triggered the healing of this mother-in-law. A mega fever racked her body. She couldn't rise to her feet and serve, even if she'd wanted to. But when Jesus lifted her hand, it also lifted her heart and her hope and her faith. She reached beyond how she felt to something more. There's an old saying, it's always easier to act yourself into a feeling than it is to feel yourself into an action. See, most of the time, if you wait until you feel like it to do the right thing, to forgive, to care, to give, to serve, you'll wait forever. You have to stop responding to the fever, and you have to respond by faith to God's promise. You've got to reach beyond the fever to something more. And I've seen situations where just one person in the family took a bold step of faith and reached out for the hem of his garment. A humbled spouse or a willing child started doing the right thing, even if it wasn't easy, and it unleashed God's healing throughout the whole family. Think of it, today you could be the one to get the ball rolling in your family. Let me close by reading an interesting letter. Larry and Joanne were an ordinary couple and like ordinary couples, they struggled to make ends meet and do the right things for their children. And they had squabbles. Much of their conversation concerned what was wrong in their marriage and who was to blame. Until one day, an extraordinary event took place. Joanne, I've got a magic chest of drawers. Every time I open them, they're full of socks and underwear. I want to thank you for filling them up all these years. Joanne stared at her husband. What do you want? <laughs> oh, nothing. I just wanted you to know I appreciate those magic drawers. Well, this wasn't the first time Larry had done something odd. So Joanne pushed the incident out of her mind until a few days later. Joanne, thanks for recording the right check numbers in the ledger. Joanne, that was a great dinner. Joanne, the house looks spiffy today. By now, Joanne was getting worried. Where's the sarcasm, the criticism, the biting remarks she was so used to? Joanne's fears that something peculiar was happening to her husband were confirmed by her 16-year-old daughter, Shelly, who complained, Dad's gone bonkers, Mom. He just told me I look nice. With all this makeup and these sloppy clothes, he still said that. That's not dad, mom. What's wrong with him? Whatever was wrong, Larry didn't get over it. Day after day, he focused on the positive. Over the weeks, Joanne grew more used to his unusual behavior and occasionally even said a begrudging thank you. She prided herself in taking it all in stride until one day something so weird happened, she became completely discombobulated. I want you to take a break, Joanne, Larry said. Take your hands off that frying pan. Get out of this kitchen. I'll do the dishes. Long, long pause. Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. Joanne's step was now a little lighter. And once in a while, she even found herself humming a song. The blue moods she experienced were getting fewer and fewer. That would have been the end of this story, except one day, another extraordinary event took place. This time it was Joanne who spoke. Larry, I want to thank you for going to work and providing for us all these years. I didn't think I've ever told you how much I appreciate it. Larry has never revealed the reason for his dramatic change of behavior, no matter how hard Joanne has pushed him for an answer. And so it will likely remain one of life's mysteries. And the letter ends. But it's a mystery I'm thankful to live with. You see, I'm Joanne. Joanne's letter highlights how a family can start over 
even if just one family member begins to do the right thing. Even when there's no assurance that per, that person's goodwill will ever be appreciated or reciprocated. Just one obedient life is all it takes to get a miracle rolling in your family. And my question to you, is God calling you to be that person in your family? Well, how can you get healed of the mega fever in your family? There are four moves that you need to make. You need to invite Jesus to come over to your house. You need to bring him home from church. Then you need to turn over your problems to him. Even if it means admitting that your family's not perfect, let him take over not only your problems, but the direction of your family. And then start over doing what he commands. Even if it's a little awkward, trust Jesus to bring healing to your family as you do what he asks. Hey, I was told earlier, there's somebody that wants to ride home with you after church today. Jesus wants to come over to your house. For there is a fever raging that he can heal. Turn it over to him. Let him take over your family. You'll be amazed by the miracles. For Jesus will give your family the opportunity to start over and serve. Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. And Lord, I thank you for all the ministry families that are here today. Lord, we pray that you would give us the victory, that you would not let Satan defeat our families, that you would drive out the fever that exists in our families. Lord, we trust you. Forgive us, Lord, for being too occupied at your house that we haven't brought you home to our house. Lord, we want to change that. And Lord, we want to turn over our problems and stop pretending to be something we're not. We want to be honest. And we want you to take over the situation, Lord, because our problems are bigger than what we can handle on our own. We know we need to get you involved. And Lord, I believe you'll help us start over and you'll turn us from selfishness to service if we truly trust in you. So Lord, you win the victory in our families. And as you do, Lord, you'll make us more fruitful in our ministries. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said...